Good. Sharing a laugh. Hey, it's Dave, and it's a new year, and this is Some Arts, and I am talking with Tim Devon from the Somerville Public Library, who has spearheaded uh, a new collection out there, mm -hmm. the Long Arm Stapler, <laughs> Long Arm Stapler Small Press Collection. Yep. All right, I got that right. Uh, so it, the collection is made up of zines. Mm -hmm. I know the zines. What else is it made up of? Sure, yeah. So zines, basically anything from a small local press. So zines, small magazines, uh, poetry chapbooks, small pamphlets, um, like this one right here, um, small newsletters. Uh, so basically anything that is produced in small quantities that was uh, made locally. So. That's kind of like the definition of ephemera, yeah, right? Yeah. And it, so, so things that were made intentionally, kind of for small distribution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, and mostly with photocopy technology, or um, not, ex not, not really. exclusively. I mean, the older stuff, um, like for instance, this I think is on color copier, um, Hermanot, which was a 1990s, 1980s, and 1990s Jamaica Plain zine was photocopier, but a lot of the stuff um, is more professionally printed, like this, the breakfast cereal magazine from Alston, Flake, um, <laughs> is, is um, pretty professionally printed. Um, yeah, so it's not really just the, the method of printing. Mm -hmm. It's more the, um, you know, the focus, the, the focus on local writers and local distribution um, that kind of define what we're collecting. Okay. And the audience for these, who, who who's it ideally made for? Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is it made for a general audience? Yeah, that's what's kind of interesting about these, because they're they're like super niche, right? Like, so this is the zine about thrifting, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, so it's kind of niche uh, audience, and that's one of the things that I think is so interesting about these, is that. You know, they're produced in like really low quantities. Some of them, you know, as, as small as 25 or 50. Um, others, you know, maybe a few hundred, maybe a thousand copies. But so what happens then is that outside of these small circles of people, nobody really ever sees them, right? And so for instance, um, let's see, what's a good example of that? Um, so here's uh, Gilmore Tammy's uh, poetry chapbook which she produced by hand. Um, she printed out uh, herself and then she folded and stapled and gave to people. And so that's a local poet and that's her preferred way to get her stuff out there. But then mm -hmm. the, the upshot is that only you know 200 people, 100 people, whatever, ever see it. And then after a little while, people think, well, um, you know, it's ephemeral and you know, things start disappearing because nobody really holds on to them. So then that gets lost, right? And um, so, for instance, one of these that we have, uh, so this is Pagan Kennedy, uh, who's a local writer, and back in the 1990s, she was a, she did zines, 1980s and 1990s. And this is like one of the only copies of this left, right? Wow. And so it's kind of cool that we have that, uh, but it's also kind of sad because then you think about like how many of the other things, you know, have been lost right. uh, in the process. So is that is that the point of the collection yeah. is to... Yeah. Uh, not only archive these, but because they are part of the circulation within the library, people can check them out yeah. and view them as well. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so part of it is um, just to archive this stuff, uh, you know, as much as we can, like going back, but also going forward. Um, just try to get all of the stuff being produced locally, uh, because they have all these all these really interesting viewpoints. You know, um, there's this idea that. You know, libraries are collecting oral histories that of uh, different residents, and so what I was thinking was it would be nice to what we were thinking is it would be nice to collect um, uh, these thoughts that are printed in small quantities as well. Um, Did you have to sell uh, the library on this idea? No, um, no. I think that they were really receptive to it. Um, the library is really interested in um, you know we have a local history collection, uh, local history room, which has a lot of um, Locally published uh, books with you know proper spines, um, so like proper books. Yeah. Um, 
But so we really hadn't been collecting this stuff. And you know, the Boston area is, was sort of a hotbed for this in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Not so much anymore, but uh, used to be more. Um, and so it just made sense for Somerville Public Library to start collecting it. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And there is a history of um, archiving and uh, a zine library, yeah. right? The, the yeah. paper cut zine library yeah. is Somerville, Cambridge. Um, so there, there's that kind of presence that's already uh, in Somerville. If they're even in existence anymore. Well, they're in Cambridge now. Oh, are yeah. they? Okay. Um, yeah, so some of uh, So there is a, a connection uh, yeah, to, yeah. to to ephemera, to zines, to pamphlets. Um, the fact that they are like uh, so ephemeral and maybe not necessarily made uh, with being archived in mind, um, is there some, does that present challenges to putting them in a library? Yeah, um, well, I mean, they're, they are kind of fragile, right? Yeah. So, like for instance, this one right here, just to pick up on thrift score again, this one right here has a little like flag. A little American flag. Because yeah, <laughs> it's the, the bicentennial edition. Um, so they are kind of fragile. This one, uh, which I think is just beautiful, is hand stitched. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, it's hand tinted. It's photocopied inside, but it has these little plastic um, toys on the thread, right? And so that, these are super fragile. Um, other ones are sturdier, but still kind of fragile. Like yeah. this one is, um, you know, just paper, right? Paper stapled. Um, and so, yeah, we are trying to keep them in like plastic sleeves, but anything over uh, newer than 2000 can be checked out of the library. Anything older than 2000 stays in the library. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Great, and you brought uh, a few selections from the collection. Yeah. Um, did you want to talk about any of these? Yeah, for sure. Right. So, um, so it's zines, it's newsletters, it's small books, uh, it's small magazines. So one of the ones over here that I got is the Grassroots Mapping Forum, which is by Somerville-based uh, Public Lab, which is a nonprofit that tries to create DIY um, environmental sensors to try to level the playing field for environmental activism. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they produce in very low quantities these um, newsletters, which have um, all of their research in them. And some of this is online, but it's presented here uh, as a newspaper. And it's this really beautiful format oh, where it, it folds, folds out, out into wow. this uh, huge poster. I don't know if you can see that. Um, some of them, the entire inside is one poster that's just a visual. This one is like an infographic. And so we've got these. Um, I've also got, um, let's see here. So here's a, an example of a small press pamphlet or you know, whatever you want to call it, small book. Uh, this is a very recent local publication of longtime Somerville residents. Hmm. Uh, it was part of a uh, memoir project, I believe, put together by the Council on Aging. Yeah, the Council on Aging uh, just came out. So, you know, as you can see, it's um, and is it collected covers. stories? Yep. And it has little photos. Oh of the, wow! The authors. That's um, great. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, I've also got uh, this zine by uh, Marissa Falco, who unfortunately recently was priced out of Somerville. Um, which seems to be happening more and more with artists. Uh, she, with this zine, she talks about creativity with uh, another artist, and you know they kind of illustrated their conversation with little drawings and doodles, which is kind of cool. And when I think zine, that's immediately what I think. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. uh, an, an article where the, uh, the author, or maybe uh, a friend of the author is, uh, passionate about a subject and they develop a zine all about it and so there's different articles, there's drawings that supplement and surround the, the, the writings, uh, there's comics. <coughs> yeah, when I think zines, I think, I think that sort of format. Yeah, totally, totally. So that's kind of a classic yeah. zine format. That's awesome. Yeah, and you were talking earlier about you know, photocopied versus professionally printed. Yeah, yeah this is totally photocopied. And um, yeah, there was, um, I wish I had brought it, there was one that 
was photocopied, but photocopied poorly and not folded right, so like pages were sticking out on the uh, corners. Mm. I don't know, that's like the, the total zine kind of thing. Um, yeah, and that's sort of like this is aesthetic, you know, like I didn't bring too many of those, but it's, you know, like, it kind of embraces the DIY spirit. You know, like this one here, Beer Frame, is this like famous zine, right? But they try to be professional, you know, they've got like a <laughs> logo, they've got like a price on it, you know, it tries to be like, a real thing and you know more power to them right but other people kind of more embrace the DIY quality of it right uh, which is kind of fun too um, yeah typically like you have uh, people who want to make their own books they already have maybe a, a sense of design yeah but maybe they're not for whatever reason able to to work on their own stuff or to have an outlet in yeah. to make money they're usually working for other people so, but a zine is like wholly 100% um, the author's vision, which I also appreciate. It's not like, yeah, totally. it's not vision by committee. It's not like um, uh, done with, um, I, I don't know, it's not, it's not too overthought in a lot of cases. It, it's it's kind of like the way that you have a conversation with a person who's passionate about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you often just just get it like warts and all. It's kind of like a, a. I'm probably gonna edit this out. <laughs> I'm no, rambling. No, like, no, that's totally it. No, that's totally it. And that's yeah. what's cool about, you know. And if you look at it from archiving community perspectives, yep. Vantage point. Then that's totally why this stuff is important to a library, and why it should be important to a community. It's it's these um, local viewpoints that aren't gonna make national news, that aren't gonna make, um, you know, Macmillan or whatever the new huge publishing chain is. And, but it's still like a valid thing and it's still something that other people are interested in right. within the community. And it should be out there. And so then the ways are, the question is like, how do you put that out there? Do you put it online? Do you make your own zine or a small book? And these people, for whatever reason, chose you know not to go online to go with books, mm. and yeah, and it's yeah, it's totally a celebration of these of these. Um, so I'm looking for something particular here. What's the totally what's the a, appeal of making it in this uh, analog format as opposed yeah. to going 100% like digital? Yeah. What 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 is the I, like? I know what the appeal is to me. I as a zine maker. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious to know like, what the appeal is for you as a zine maker and also as a uh, collector sure, yeah. of um, these. Yeah, I think that one of the reasons, so if you want to reach as many people as possible, then online is probably the way to go. But with that comes all kinds of limits, right? One is that your website is going to go away at one point, right? Um, another one is that you don't really have control over the visuals and the, the presentation. And another one is, you know, how do people read things online as opposed to how people read and appreciate things in, in person, like in physical sense. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, okay, so like take this one. We were talking about this one earlier, right? This is Pagan Kennedy's Living, which is her guide to um, basically, you know, early 1990s hipsters, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so like here's something about 8-Track Mind, which was a famous zine at the time. It, uh -huh. it was a, a review of 8-Tracks in the early 1990s. 8-Tracks. <laughs> yeah, which yes. was really hot in the 1990s. But so, you know, this is still around. This is still kicking around. And um, it gets passed from person to person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wind up in the trash and recycling a lot. but. You know, they also wind up unexpectedly. Like, uh, Pagan gave us a lot of her stuff that was in her attic. And with that box came this. You know, this was in a box with her zines. And so this is survived on. I have no idea who made this. I can't <laughs> find out who made this, right? But this is still kicking around. And so this lives longer than uh, the internet, I think. Um, there's also like a control over it. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna present your personal story, you don't want 900 million people to be able to see it. You want, you know, 12 people to see it. You want it to be um, more locked down. Right. I think they're they're as they're as personal as 
um, the viewpoints within, maybe? Yeah. Like yeah, 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 boom, yeah, exactly. Um, so, like this one, uh, Inspiration by, um, by Marissa Falco, this has some personal stuff in it, and they didn't want, they could have presented it as a website, but they want, they don't want their names associated with that in a Google search, for instance. They want just people that they've given the book to, um, to be able to read it. So there's a nice anonymity to, yeah, to so. doing things in such a, a, an analog way still. Like the, there's an appeal to that in, yeah. the, in the age of big data. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Cool. Um, what's this one here, Accordion? Oh, yeah, this yeah, This looks yeah, like yeah. an so, uh, anthology maybe? Or, uh, so no? this is relatively recent and it's um, edited by Maggie Jensen who is temporarily in Chicago, but she lives in Jamaica Plain. And it is a zine about art. And so it has some nice interviews, it has some nice pieces. And each issue is about a different topic. And this one, I don't know if you can see that, is about gatekeepers. So um, I thought this was really kind of a nice thing to talk about on a show about self-publishing is gatekeepers. So like. One of the reasons that people, you know, you were saying earlier, one of the reasons that people, you know, self-publish is because they don't want to go through all the gatekeeping right. and all the compromises that come with that. So anyway, uh, Maggie put together this um, this issue about gatekeeping, and it's got, um, I think you know, her. It's got this really great um, graphic. I don't know if you can see that about how gatekeeping is a lot like. Um, locks and control. Hmm. Um, anyway, it's got some nice um, nice stuff in it. Cool. Um, and yeah. Um, just two others that I haven't mentioned is, can I show this one? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the No Nonsense Guide to Street Harassment, Don't Tell Me to Smile, <laughs> which is about, um, you know, how to defend yourself and how to, how to stay safe. Um, and so the motivation here, I think, to making this as a zine is it's cheap enough you can distribute that mm. really freely. Uh, and then we have uh, Liz Prince, who um, is a former Somerville resident, you know, kind of familiar story, moved out of Somerville recently. Uh, this is her, um, one of her little um, comic books. Whoa, it's very little. I'm trying to yeah, get it's in tiny. on that. Nice. It's tiny. And she's been working in that format for, for quite a while, that kind of three or four panel format, um, riffing off of like the classic newspaper, newspaper three or four panel yep. comics like Garfield or, or however, yeah. But she uses her own life as um, subject matter, yeah. um, as is the case with a lot of cartoonists. Um, cool, yeah, I actually haven't seen that one. This is, this is a nice uh, sampling of, of the library's collection. Now, how, how many um, small press uh, items are in the collection at the moment? Yeah, right now we have about 60 um, that are on the shelves, and then another <coughs> 80 to 100 that are downstairs in processing. Uh, so some of the ones that I brought today are not like available right now, but they will be soon. Shortly, sure. Um, and yeah, so uh, one thing that I did want to mention is that we're actively uh, trying to build a collection. So if you have anything, you know, get in touch. We'd love to have it. Cool. For sure. Um, and so is there, like on a, on a logistical, like speaking again to like um, um, uh, acquiring these for the library, is there anything special that needs to be done with these um, as opposed to uh, a book? or, or um, a more widely read piece of material? I'm gonna reword that question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so going, so, so speaking about like uh, the, the library uh, procedures, is, is there anything special that needs to be done with the zines to uh, bring them into the collection? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I was really surprised by. So there are very few libraries that collect small press things and one of the reasons that I'm finding for that is because libraries in general, not just some of the public library, but libraries in general, want to go through vendors. And vendors, it's the same story of why this stuff doesn't wind up in bookstores. Because bookstores want to go through vendors. So you can go through a distributor, I think you go through a distributor for your, your stuff. Yeah. So um, 
distributors can get them placed in some stores and some libraries, but only those that work with those distributors, right? But a lot of people don't even have distributors. It's hard to get a distributor. And so then um, not a lot of bookstores or libraries have these things. So what you have to do is you have to, um, you have to work with the seller to set them up as a vendor for the city. And so then it becomes this whole thing that um, makes it hard to buy uh, individual items, which is too bad because um, you know, that just kind of replicates the problem that zine makers and small press people face on a daily basis, which is, you know, how do you get out of your friend circle with what you make? Right. Um, there's a, um, two of the major zine distributors are changing their policies recently. And I don't want to get too much into that, but basically it's affecting zine makers and they're not able to get their stuff out as readily as they were before. And that's just a basic like function of capitalism is that the, the distributors are making tough choices on what they carry and how they get it out there. And then that kind of like affects how people uh, are able to reach their audience. Yeah, that was a really long-winded answer <laughs> to your question. Yeah, it's hard to get these stuff into the library yeah. because of how we have to purchase them. And zines um, and small press tend to be um, a low price point anyway. Yeah. So the, this is stuff that's in the um, dollar, two dollar, three dollar, five dollar. Occasionally they top ten dollars, but that that kind of low price range. So. People don't get into zines necessarily to be making money. Um, <laughs> they yeah, they get into yeah. uh, small press to um, forward their uh, agenda, to um, reach a wider audience, to let people know about subcultures, yeah, um, for sure. to to get information out uh, through. Um, a, a typical uh, channels and a, a typical not the internet. Um, it's not anything like the the wider media would cover uh, necessarily, um, and it's it's kind of a classic format, the printed word. Um, so there, th these uh, this collection, zines, ephemera, it, en it encompasses all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. What's the future of the collection? Uh, yeah, so uh, the future of the collection, um, I, I'm talking to a number of local poetry people about what poetry chapbooks to get in because that's something we're kind of lacking in right now. I mean, we're looking for everything, right? So um, small magazines, zines, comics, uh, all that stuff. But what we're really lacking in right now are poetry chapbooks. So I want to um, you know, do more digging into finding out like what the local scene for that is. Uh, and we're also having a, um, a launch party uh, January 25th at 7 p.m. at the main library, 79 Highland Ave. Uh, Jeff Chekai, uh, Gilmore Tammy, and Pagan Kennedy are all going to um, talk about their experiences with zines. That's great. We're going to have, yeah, we're going to have like stuff, um, you know, there in the auditorium for people to look at. Uh, people are welcome to bring their stuff to show as well. Um, yeah, it'll be fun. That sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and I can't, has the library ever had an, a zine related event like that? Uh, there have been a couple of um, like zine workshops, which I think we're going to do again like down the road, but not, I don't know, this is sort of like a celebration of um, local self-publishing culture. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, cool. Thanks for taking the time out to, uh, to come down and yeah, thanks for having show me. us selections from the long arm stapler small press collection of the Somerville Public Library. Um, this is Tim Devon. Uh, get your stuff out to him, zine makers, and come out to the party January 25th. Uh, all right, thanks again, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having me. Here are some additional listings for events in and near Somerville for January and February. Boston Free Radio is super excited to be hosting an upcoming show at Once Ballroom on Wednesday, January 17th from 8 to 11 p.m. The show promises to be a genre and gender bending night of queer, femme, punk, and electronic music featuring 
Baby, Sister, DJ Luna Mariposa, and Boston Free Radio DJ Layla Safavi. Tickets are sent $7 in advance and $10 at the door. Get your tickets and find links to these performers' band camp pages at bostonfreeradio.com. On Sunday, January 21st, Journeys in Sound presents Columba and Joseph Allred polyphonics singing and guitar solely at the Arts of the Armory Cafe from 4 to 6 p.m. Columba is a versatile vocal trio based in Boston. Their eclectic repertoire includes folk harmony singing from Georgia, Corsica, Ukraine, and the Balkans, Eastern European dance tunes, early music, original compositions, and more. Joseph Allred fits the guitar solely realm perfectly, fully embodying the guitar loner typecast. His 12-string playing has a leaning towards Eastern musical traditions and droning freeform raga. Suggested donation of $15 and more information can be found at artsatthearmory.org. Saturday, February 10th, Once Ballroom hosts Boston Stands Again, a Mardi Gras benefit for the ACLU, featuring the legendary Voodoo Crew, plus special guests Sarah Borges, Carla Ryder, Michelle Paulus, and much more. Details and tickets are at onesummerville.com. As always, events change and are sometimes canceled, so be sure to check with the event website if you do plan to attend any one of these events. If you have your own event that you'd like us to feature on Some Arts or on our digital community bulletin board, send an email to programming at somervillemedia.org. Programming at somervillemedia.org with all the relevant uh, details. All right, that's it for January and February. I'm Dave Ortega for the Somerville Media Center. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next month.